Thank you for inviting me to take part in this uh, initiative. I find it extremely stimulating. Um, the video has its advantages and disadvantages. The disadvantage is that I cannot share the screen uh, and I have prepared a very short uh, PowerPoint to um, make it uh, easier for you to follow my uh, basic points. In any case, I will be extremely uh, schematic and try to make my points as clear as possible. So, um, in principle, and this is the departing point, um, it is not a legal issue to uh, determine whether a conflict is justified uh, or it, if it is not justified and even less uh, to determine who is right in a conflict and who is wrong. These are matters that entail moral and political arguments uh, which are extremely important, of course, uh, but are not uh, per se the um, matter of uh, a legal assessment. From a purely legal point of view, uh, the only alternative to a conflict um, is a procedure. If you do not want to have a conflict escalate, uh, the only possibility is to proceduralize it and make it, um, you know, uh, kind of controllable from a, a legal point of view. And the legal response to that is a procedure. Proceduralization is the lesson that uh, can be drawn from about three centuries of constitutionalism. The step-by-step uh, -step expansion of the real of constitutional law is what constitutionalism has been about for about three, at least three, three centuries. Um, and uh, this means that uh, constitutional regulation has progressively and step by step uh, included areas that were previously determined by the rule of force. Uh, or by what uh, Georg Jelinek uh, has called the normative power of the factual. Um, so a fact became a norm simply because something was happening. Um, when it comes to uh, territorial conflicts of sovereignty, uh, the uh, paramount example of this uh, proceduralization uh, is represented, in my view, uh, by the reference uh, by the Supreme Court of Canada on the secession of Quebec. Because this reference inaugurated a, a functional and procedural approach to territorial conflicts of sovereignty. Yeah? Since the 1998 uh, uh, reference, uh, it became clear that these conflicts are to be subject to a legal regulation. Uh, and that legal regulation uh, must be procedural in nature. Yeah? Um, so the point of departure of uh, every legal um, consideration in that respect is that um, if we want to avoid that there is uh, a prevalence of force, of arbitrariness, of uh, normative power of the factual, then you need to have a procedure in place. How this procedure is designed and what the content of that is, is predominantly a matter of the political process. This is the first and departing point. My second point is about Europe. This is where uh, actually our panel is, is in. Um, and the question is uh, whether uh, Europe should intervene in uh, this machinery, whether Europe should become um, one of the actors of uh, such processes of proceduralization. Well, in principle, um, there is a little difference as to the level of government which develops procedures. Actually, Europe is an integrated, uh, multi-level space, um, and and these processes must include more levels of government. So yes, of course, there is room uh, and probably um, a necessary uh, part of that for Europe, but at the same time, 
uh, Europe can definitely not be the sole regulator of such procedures. So uh, there must be a, um, uh, an amount of actors who come up with procedures, Europe being one of them. Probably not the most relevant one because these conflicts are primarily a matter of domestic constitutional law. Um, the European level has, of course, another layer of, you know, difficulty in a way. Um, it, it is strongly conditioned by meta-legal factors. Yeah? Apart from the pure political considerations, and we all know that most member states would be, of course, hesitant, to say the least, uh, in, in supporting any European intervention on, in these conflicts for obvious reasons, but also uh, structural aspects connected with the uh, way Europe is built play a role. Um, I think it was Michael Keating uh, back in 2002, uh, something like that, uh, who um, kind of prophesized that um, Growing autonomy within uh, the states reduces separatist claims um, as it is more convenient uh, for strong regions to uh, effectively participate in a multi-level structure uh, than uh, claiming for separation and secession. Well, the passing of time has shown that this prophecy was, was probably wrong um, and the opposite uh, turned out to be more uh, frequent uh, because there are uh, uh, more and more claims for secession uh, in European uh, countries um, and this is because I guess of the institutional structure of the EU which makes it more convenient, more attractive to be a state rather than to be a region. Uh, take the case of Malta versus, let's say, Bavaria, Catalonia, uh, Scotland, what have you, you know, uh, well, Scotland no more, um, as strong regions uh, in the EU. It is more convenient to be perhaps a small state than an important part of a big country uh, because the rules of representation, the institutional composition of the uh, um, institutions uh, at EU level favor statehood. So this might be even an incentive to claim uh, sovereignty and statehood rather than uh, claiming autonomy within countries. In any case, uh, due to its basically still intergovernmental structure, Europe can do quite little in my view in this regard. Um, it can, what it can do is just simply promote good procedural practices such as the code uh, or, or others uh, and call for procedural solutions. This is the only thing uh, Europe can plausibly do. But it would be utopian to believe that the European Union can take a proactive role uh, on this issue. So Europe uh, should probably intervene, yes, but um, it should not be expected that uh, European intervention uh, can go uh, really far uh, in that. It can promote constitutionalism. This is part of the mission of the EU and therefore promoting constitutionalism means promoting procedural solutions to all sorts of conflicts, including this one. My third and final point is perhaps the most important. So um, if we need procedures, what kind of procedures do we need? And here, um, what I want to make is a sort of a case against the, the monopoly of referendums. I would like to call it this way. Um, a growing number of constitutions of the last generation um, are trying to kind of regulate uh, the territorial sovereignty conflicts. And um, in most cases, when this is done, uh, the purpose is to tame uh, sovereignty claims, right? Um, the response, as I said, is basically procedural. So a few constitutions now tend to include procedures to deal with secession of part of the territories. Um, this is part of the constitutionalization of a new phenomenon. This is the positive side. Where is the problem of that? The problem is that while the trend to introduce procedures to regulate this conflict is 
certainly a positive thing. The content of such rules is mostly still, I would say, disappointing. All boils down in the end to a referendum. All attempts, regardless of uh, successful or failed uh, attempts to uh, secede um, that have taken place throughout the world over the past three decades, um, underwent a referendum. A referendum seems to be an uh, unavoidable uh, step in that direction. Well, per se, there is nothing wrong on that. Don't get, get me wrong. But um, my point is that referendum is necessary but not enough. The last uh, separation that took place uh, without a referendum uh, was in 1991 uh, when Czechoslovakia split apart. Um, and that was also for political reasons, uh, probably because that was an elite-driven process and uh, the uh, people back then would not have favored uh, this uh, split, most likely. Uh, the other uh, partial exception is Kosovo in 2008, which declared unilateral independence without a referendum, although a referendum was actually uh, held in the 1990s, um, of course, uh, illegitimately from the Serbian point of view. Um, so, in several contexts, the uh, over-emphasizing of referendum has uh, even um, led to the paradoxical situation that uh, the so-called right to decide has even replaced, you know, the claim for secession. Um, most of the advocates of secession uh, do not really claim secession per se. They claim a right to the side. They claim the right to a um, majoritarian decision by referendum uh, by the people um, in order to uh, let the people vote on their destiny, which is good. There is nothing wrong on that. But this alone is problematic. Why is this problematic? Because it is oversimplistic. It is or it runs the risk of becoming populistic, and above all, it contradicts the non-majoritarian essence of constitutionalism. Constitutionalism is about checks and balances. If you only have one uh, moment of decision, clear-cut, black and white, by simple majorities, well, this is a problem. Referenda, as I said, are of course an essential step in, in such processes, but cannot be the only steps, right? Um, the referendum, instead, uh, in the last generation of, of constitution making, uh, has become um, the only, the exclusive uh, means to address sovereignty claims. And this is problematic. In most cases, referendums are held without further entrenchments, so no quorum, uh, no qualified majorities, nothing, just simply, you know, who shows up decides. Um, and there is also a purely, I would call it binary alternative, right? Independence, yes, independence, no. Without considering more options, which are in fact um, normally an interesting possibility. See the Scottish case, right? We, we know that uh, initially, the a third option was uh, uh, considered, um, so uh, the so-called devolution plus, uh, so more autonomy uh, instead of uh, between the status quo or independence, also more autonomy. And then, uh, to my information, it was actually London who refused because they were uh, sure uh, to win the referendum uh, that the majority would have uh, rejected uh, independence. And then, you know, <laughs> in the end, they promised to uh, come up with more autonomy, which then they did after the referendum, uh, you know, voted relatively, uh, you know, close in favor of remaining with the UK. Well, um, the, the limit of referendums is, in fact, uh, not that they are wrong, they are right, but they are too simplistic, they are trivial, especially when uh, deciding on uh, existential issues like secession and statehood, and even more uh, if they are not supported by procedural entrenchments or by additional procedures. 
uh, the independence referendum that was held in Quebec in 1995 did not require any special majority, like most uh, other subsequent referendums. And uh, as you all know, it was rejected by really a handful of votes. And the outcome uh, on, on the referendum um, in Scotland, on, on Scottish independence in 2014 and in, on Brexit uh, in 2016, were largely determined by the definition of the eligible voters. Yeah? There was quite a different constituencies between the two referendums. And then there is always the question of structural minorities, which is a challenge for referendum. If a decision is to be made by a, a majority, um, especially if this is a simple majority, without a quorum, uh, with a very extemporary um, uh, decision making in just one day, uh, well, then uh, this is uh, problematic. Um, especially for structural minorities. In the Brexit referendum, 62 and more percent of the votes in Scotland and also a, a big majority of votes in Northern Ireland were for Remain. Uh, and they represented a much uh, stronger support uh, than the 52, 51.9, uh, I guess, percent for Leave in the whole UK. So how to decide in these matters? Uh, constitutional counterbalances are necessary to enhance the rule of law as opposed to the rule of, let's say, occasional majorities. The common denominator of any formula in this regard um, cannot but be the combination of procedures that produce an effect that goes beyond the plebiscitary uh, majoritarianism represented by uh, non-entrenched referendums. Um, and should combine uh, the democratic element, so the decision by people, uh, with the rule of law, hmm? with respect for minorities, with uh, a procedural uh, entrenchment. What do I have in mind? And I conclude with that. Uh, examples are to be seen around the comparative practice. So the first obvious counterbalance is to provide for quorums. Uh, both for the turnout and for the approval in a referendum on, on independence, for example, as was provided, for example, uh, in, in Montenegro uh, in 2006, uh, a double majority was required. Um, and also, this is a way to respond to the requirement by the Canadian Supreme Court when they uh, said, uh, well, there needs to be a clear majority, whatever it means, in favor of independence. So the first one is quorums. Hmm? The second idea um, is um, to repeat referendums within a given time frame in order to better ascertain uh, the real will of the voters and not make the outcome conditional upon occasional variables, you know. Um, in that day, a thin majority of people voted for this or for that. Is that really representative? I mean, we have the fantastic, in my view, um, example of New Caledonia, uh, which is uh, to be uh, holding three referendums uh, uh, within uh, uh, six years. The first two have already taken place uh, and uh, a majority, while uh, you know, thinner and thinner, um, was still in favor of remaining with France, but there will be another one in uh, 2022. Um, but also see the example of several referendums on EU treaties that took place uh, repeatedly in uh, some member states, uh, Ireland, Denmark, etc., uh, rejecting uh, the treaty first and then, you know, reapproving it. So not only one referendum, but probably more. Uh, that would be more representative and more legitimate. The third one, uh, as I mentioned, is to include uh, more than just two options uh, to the vote, like the example of uh, Scotland, you know, do you want independence? Do you want status quo? Do you want more autonomy to be negotiated uh, with the uh, state, the central authorities? Fourth, um, and very importantly, make the referendum 
um, an important but not an exclusive step uh, to decide on these conflicts. Uh, for example, uh, involve parliaments, possibly with uh, qualified majorities. We have the example of the Ethiopian constitution on that, which requires a request for starting the procedure uh, to secede or to create uh, um, new, um, new entities in the federation by uh, at least two thirds majority of the legislature of the entity concerned. Right. So qualified majority in referendum in, in parliaments can uh, start the procedure uh, before a referendum. So it could be, for example, provided that uh, if a subnational parliament adopts a motion for secession with a qualified majority, then the national parliament can stop it only by an equally qualified majority or things like that. You know, the, the, the fantasy can, be, uh, can work uh, on that, the institutional creativity. Fifth, important, include the courts um, in the clarification of the processes, right? Um, for example, by means of um, giving the courts um, the uh, option to provide for uh, advisory opinions, uh, possibly at the beginning of a process, not when the political uh, process has already escalated, because then it can become problematic. But uh, it cannot be ignored that courts play an important role in that. And then, for example, uh, deriving, so I, I'm not aware of any uh, example already existing, but I think it could be uh, imaginable to uh, draw from the experience of the constitutional reform processes uh, to provide that after a referendum, new elections must be uh, held and the ratification uh, of the uh, outcome of the referendum must um, um, take place uh, by the new parliament. So that it's uh, so a little bit like the total revision of constitutions. You uh, decide first, then the people vote, uh, and then there is a, uh, election, and then the new parliament has to uh, ratify the decision in order to you know, include, again, more layers, more actors. So um, there can be many procedural rules, but what matters is that conflicts on territorial sovereignty uh, should not undermine the guarantees of constitutionalism and uh, don't have to become uh, over majoritarian or, or even plebiscitary forms of constitutionalism. So um, yes, we need procedures and yes, we need uh, procedures that are uh, compatible with the idea uh, of pluralism uh, in uh, decision making. With that in mind, I think the code is exactly um, an example which goes into this direction and I hope it uh, can be successful uh, as it deserves. Thank you very much.